thank you for inviting me. Uh, sorry that my Swedish is not very good, but I spend a lot of time working on various uh, research er uh, arenas related to climate and the environment and ecology. I would say now I've been doing this for about 10 years, and many of you I've seen for almost 10 years, and the story hasn't gotten better, okay? The title of my talk is Every Tenth of a Degree Matters. The recent uh, synthesis report came out of the sixth report from the IPCC. So about every five years, the uh, International Panel for Climate Change, a United Nations body that brings together thousands of scientists from around the world, synthesizes the state-of-the-art knowledge of our climate system. So we now have the sixth report and consisted of three volumes that, that started coming out in 2021 in the autumn. And this is the synthesis of those three volumes. And I would have to say that the three volumes together equal something like 4,000 pages. So it's necessary to have a synthesis. Now I want to point out that um, I know that in this room we don't have the uh, issue of people not believing that climate change is real. But on the other hand, it's the degree at this point. I'm not worried about the nihilism today. I'm worried about the degree that we take it seriously in terms of the need to start acting. And I want to point out in two not very left publications in the United States, Popular Mechanics, which is a magazine that still exists today, and the Saturday Evening Post, a magazine that still exists today, published in 1911, The Effect of the Combustion of Coal on Our Climate, What Scientists Predict About the Future. So this was known. Okay? It was known in 1911. In 1950, a multi-page article in the Saturday Evening Post, again, not a left-wing magazine or newspaper, talking about, are we living in a warming world? In 1956, oceanographer Roger Revelle made a comment in a scientific paper that he had published. So a scientific paper meaning something that you send to a scientific journal, your peers review it, and they decide whether your ideas are sound or not. So it's not like publishing an opinion piece in the newspaper. You know, this is a rigorous scientific process. He pointed out that humanity is carrying out a large-scale geophysical experiment. And by what he meant by that is that by burning fossil fuels and all the other things we do in terms of changing how the land looks, you know, clearing forests, growing rice, making cement, carrying out wars, all of the different kinds of things that we do was altering our Earth's climate system. On the other hand, despite that 1911, 1950, and then this 1956 science, scientific report bringing up these issues, it wasn't at, by 1956 seen as something where we need to start raising red flags and you know, hitting the panic button. And it was largely because at that point, people believed that it would be absolutely insane to double the amount of carbon in the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels that somehow in the coming decades, everything would just switch to nuclear power. Now, I think you understand that that has not happened. Erpo mentioned the Keeling curve here. So 1958, Charles David Keeling went to Hawaii, went to the Mauna Loa volcano, and set an, observ an observatory to measure carbon dioxide. And what we can see is that since 1958, the carbon dioxide levels have just keep going up and up and up and up. I think it was in 1985 that, um, that Carl Sagan, the famous uh, you know, astrophysicist, testified in front of Congress of the United States saying that we were heading into a catastrophe by burning fossil fuels at the rate that we were burning. In 1990, we had our first IPCC report. In 2013, on May 13, 2013, the carbon dioxide levels passed 400 parts per million for the first time in human history. 
Now what I'm talking about in terms of human history is not just the human beings alive today, but all of Homo sapiens, all of Homo neanderthalus, all of Homo divisius, all of Homo erectus, and all of Homo habilis. We have changed the climate. We put more carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere in a very short period of time than has been there since at least two to three million years, the Pliocene, okay? I want to point out that I was born on June 12, 1968. I'm almost 55. And the carbon dioxide levels were 325 parts per million. I think it's very important to think about when we look outside and it's a beautiful sunny day, it's emerging, it was a little bit of rain and snow this morning. When we look up at the sky, we don't see some dark force that's warming the climate. It's this transparent, this clear, opaque greenhouse gas that is vital to life on our planet. Plants need it for photosynthesis. Without an atmosphere, our planet would be in the neighbor, on average, something like 30 degrees colder, okay? But it's about how much is there. And it's also about the rate of change over time. When we were living in the Pliocene, well not we, but when, the, when, when we were in the Pliocene as a planet, the climate change took place over thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And today, it's taking place in a very short period. Now, just to give you some contextualization here, the period today after the Pliocene is called the Quaternary. About two million years we've been in the Quaternary. You may or may not be familiar with the fact that we've had multiple, not just a single glaciation, but multiple glacial periods in that, 20, in that two million years. So we've had glacial cycles and warm cycles, which we call interglacials. <laughs> now, just to create the context for you, Approximately the average amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at the peak of our glaciations over the last 20 million years was about 220 parts per million. Okay? So when there's very little carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it's cold. But when we were at the warm phases, the interglacial periods, the average was about 280 parts per million. So it only took about 60 parts per million to go from Ice age to not ice age. Where are we today? We're actually, as of yesterday, 422 parts per million in the atmosphere. Now, I also want to create some other context because a lot of times people want me to say what the world's going to be like in 20 years. You know, I'm an ecologist, I study birds, plants, and bumblebees it's very unlikely that I would be able to give you, or any climate scientist would be able to say accurately what the temperature will be like, what the weather will be like, but we get asked that all the time. But there's a very interesting article that came out in Nature recently, and I didn't know this, but at the northern tip of Greenland, there's a part of land that has not been glaciated. It's not been under the ice sheet. It's permafrost, but it's soil, okay? And apparently, Around two million years ago, there was a forested ecosystem there. Now, Greenland it was pretty much in exactly the same position, okay? I mean, you know, continental drift doesn't happen that quickly. So it was in approximately the same position. But there were mammoths. There were 100 species of plants that we recognize as forest species. The temperatures then were approximately 10 degrees warmer than they are today. And the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was approximately 420 parts per million, what we have today. So there's two messages in this paper. The first message is that there was an ecosystem two million years ago, the northern tip of Greenland, that had no analog to an ecosystem today. Now some of those species may still be around. It's not about whether species went extinct or not, but the point is, that with 10 degrees of warming, there was an ecosystem that is not like any ecosystem that we have on our planet today. So we start to think about what the world would be like with 10 degrees warming, say in Scandinavia at the end of the century, which is a likely scenario. We will be living in an ecosystem that we'll be completely unfamiliar with. Now, it won't be us in this room, 
but it could be our grandchildren. So what will the world be like for them? I think that's a very, very important question. So here's this first IPCC uh, volume called The Physical Basis that came out in 2021 as part of that sixth report. I'm going to highlight a couple points. The report makes it clear that the extreme weather today will be the normal weather in the future. And when we talk about the future here, we're not saying it's going to be 2029 or 2031, but we're not talking about 2231. We're talking about in, the, in this century. Could be by 2030, could be 20, by 2040, could be by 2050. Maybe you saw the news on SVT a couple of days ago that uh, they're getting so much rain in the Kebnekaiser region, despite the fact that the yucks are still frozen, all that water had nowhere to go but into the rivers, into the lakes. And the people could not ski or snowmobile out. There were about 60 people trapped at Kebnekaiser who have to take a helicopter to get out. Right? Your son sent an amazing picture he just showed me of people skiing on the water coming down from Abisko Yar on Thursday. Okay? I, I just came here from Abisko, and in the 10 years I've lived in Abisko, this, I've never seen, you know, the mountains look like they look, I mean, it looks like the end of May right now. The climate is changing fast. The hottest days today will be the cool days in our future. And the warmest winters today will be the cool winters in the future. Those are facts, okay? The synthesis report states that every tenth of a degree matters. And what I'm talking about is the um, Paris Agreement's target of holding warming to no more than two degrees by the end of the century but if we can, 1.5 degrees, all right? And it turns out that when we look at the climate models and the sensitivity of those climate models, it has emerged that a very clear story that every tenth of a degree matters. And it matters for, for food, it matters for our, the, the weather that we experience, the extreme storms, it matters for the people who live in really hot environments, who who may not be able to live in those environments, even in the coming decade. Now, I, I mean, this is one of those classic uh, report images that you see from IPCC. But this one is essentially pointing out that these are all the realms that we feel absolutely confident, these ones in dark red, where climate change is having serious impacts today and in the future. But they point out that although we are seeing impacts here in these regions, it's very, very difficult to assess the impacts in those areas. Okay? So, I mean, what will terrestrial ecosystems look like? The boreal biome, the forest that you were just talking about in Sweden, it's hard to know, but there are very, very good guesses and they're not really guesses, they're hypotheses based on our experiences as scientists. For example, the, um, the, you know, the kind of the, the reintroduction of maybe possibly catastrophic wildfires in Sweden in the future, new pathog pathogens and insect pests that could basically take out vast swaths of the forest because we have monoculture forests where every species is genetically similar, making it very easy for pathogens to attack. So how we experience the future today, I mean, how we experience the future depends on our carbon emissions today, that every tenth of a degree matters. And yet, think about what's happened with the COVID crisis. With the COVID crisis, all of a sudden, we were waving our arms in Europe and talking about the Green New Deal. Where is that Green New Deal today? Germany's building new LNG terminals, They've extended the life of coal mines and coal power power plants while shutting down their nuclear power plants. Germany has no history of earthquakes or tsunamis, okay? They're one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world. If there was a country that we could trust with nuclear power, it would probably be them. 
But when are you going to come to the question, what can we do? All of us, all of us in yes. this room. Yes. We, we know. We are very much aware of these. But we're not changes. doing the things that need to be done. I mean, we're in this room talking, but we have not created any kind of critical mass. Because if we had created some kind of critical mass, Shell, BP, and Exxon wouldn't be saying, sorry, all of our climate, um, you know, all of our climate commitments that we made after the Paris Agreement, sorry, we're just making too much money. Because that's coming out every day in the news right now. Our voices aren't being heard. You know, I think, you know, I've been involved in the environmental movement since I was in my 20s. Uh, I'm the same. I, I, <laughs> when I read the, this book about uh, <clears throat> climate change, and it, it was about in the beginning of the 60s. It was uh, to Silent Spring. Yes, um, uh, Rachel Carson. Uh, yes. I work in a place in Stockholm, for example, uh, a children's company. Yes. And uh, when I read the book, I put some <coughs> small uh, pieces of, of uh, warnings on the <coughs> on uh, the big uh, shows like the yeah, also, yeah. yeah yes, so the people words. can read about it. They took them all away. Of course they did. Because it was a journalist company. I had uh, I, had, uh, I, I worked there for six months in Carrier. Yeah. And uh, I was <coughs> really interested to <coughs> to stay there. But I had no work anymore. Yes. No, it I, was it was 50 years ago. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, that's I mean that's the that's the dilemma that I have when I give you know, when I give these talks, is that every time I give these talks, I become a bit more of, a, of an activist in a sense, a scientist activist. And instead of, you know, of um, giving you hyperbole, I'm just giving you the observed facts. And it's not making any difference, is it? Because Sweden is already warming. You know, we see it right now, all that warming is mostly taking place in the autumn and the winter. We're losing our snow. The cold winters have disappeared in our lifetimes. And, you know, these cold winters where we have snow and ice are super important because that snow and ice reflects the sun's energy away. These cold regions are the Earth's cooling system. And those cooling systems are breaking down. Imagine, go to Kuwait City or go to United Arab Emirates where the next, the next climate meeting is going to be hosted by a petrol state, which doesn't make any sense, okay? What would happen if the air conditioners broke there? Everybody would fly to Scandinavia, right? And we have all of these ecosystem processes throughout the world. This is what's happening here on land and in the ocean in these northern regions. We pollute our atmosphere, the temperatures rise, the snow and ice melt, we lose that reflective surface, the earth warms, it turns out that the best climate models tell us now that even if we stopped burning all fossil fuels tomorrow, the, warm, the planet's going to warm for another 100 to 400,000 years. Think about that. Now, does that mean that we should just give up? Absolutely not. That's what I hope Lars will be leading in the discussion. Because what we should be doing is we should be worried about the rate of change. The good news is that we as a species, evolved out of Africa. Our evolution was driven by climate changes. So we have the capacity to adapt. But it's the rate of change that matters. And so the question, the big question mark, really is, are we creating the conditions today that will not give us the ability to adapt to the future we're creating? And that future we're creating is today, not tomorrow. I mean, 1.1 degrees of warming. I mean, 90% of the warming has been absorbed by the oceans. You ask why it's not 10 degrees warmer already, because the ocean's been doing some amazing work for us. A third of the carbon dioxide we've released is being absorbed by the ocean. But it can't hold it forever. This is the thing that scares me the most, because I did not see this coming. There's been a La Nina conditions, if you know what that is. It's, a, it's, mm -hmm. it's about the warming in the Pacific Ocean, which has a big effect on the Earth's climate. 
We've had a La Nina for three years now. And it looks like we're emerging into an El Nino phase. And it's very likely that we will exceed that 1.5 degrees, even if it goes down after the El Nino, back to say 1.1 or 1.2. But we're likely to exceed 1.5 degrees of warming next year or the year after. This is happening faster than we ever thought. And it's getting faster every year, every talk I give. Mm. Every talk I give, there's new scientific papers coming out. Isn't that amazing? Yet scientists tell us, you know, my, my colleagues in other disciplines, that if we have any chance of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees by the end of the century, and this paper was published in uh, 2021, 90% of the coal has to stay in the ground. 60% of the oil and gas cannot be extracted. 50%, we, and, and that still only gives us a 50% chance of reaching that. And 1.5 degrees of warming will be catastrophic. It will be catastrophic for humanity. So we're getting close to the end, and I just want to think about like how the discussion goes. Okay, Just a few things that I've been thinking about over the years. Is there a crisis? Is there a crisis? I can go still buy beer and buy beer, you know, go get some New Orleans gold tonight and sit down on my couch and watch Netflix. It doesn't really feel like a crisis, does it? I mean, it does to us because we're here in this room, but, but even still, I don't know. I mean, if, you know, when, when my daughter fell off a cliff in Obisco, thank God it was, there was snow, and then my wife calls me and says, you know, your daughter's had an accident, there's a helicopter coming. That was a crisis, you know? But it's also about how we communicate the science. Consider our methods. We talked about averages. I mean, think about it. I told you 1.1 degrees of warming, 1.5 degrees of warming. But the reality is none of us probably in the past week have gone shopping and thought about the average price of any product that we were going to buy, and then we picked the one that was slightly cheaper than the average price, did we? We don't use averages. An average is a useful way of comparing things, but it's not a useful way of articulating this problem. And what about scientific uncertainty? I mean, that's a complete disaster, because most people uncertainty means like pizza or Thai food. And when we talk about scientific uncertainty, it's bounded by probabilities. And even if the lowest number is the most likely number, the highest number is still possible. And so it's all about risk. And scientists aren't good about communicating <coughs> risks. How about the ethic, ethical dilemmas? Is there a reasonable approach to bring about change? I mean, I've been giving these talks for 10 years, and I've experimented. I mean, I definitely have had students crying when they come in and hear me talking. We will start to cry. Yes, me too. All of us. Me too. And, 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 and then I think, well, is that really reasonable? Is it reasonable for me to take people to an emotional state that they feel hopeless? Because the reality is, the only way there's going to be a climate apocalypse is if we don't do something about it. It's in our hands. It's not a planetary crisis. It's a human crisis. That's it. So creating impact. How do we define what we want to accomplish? And how do we measure it? Well, you know, we've got some basic units. Last year, humanity emitted almost 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide. I want to point out, when the first IPCC report came out in 1990, they summarized about 1,697 scientific papers. For the AR6, they synthesized somewhere between 270,000 and 330,000 papers. Do we need to keep doing more research in order to solve the problem? I'm not saying we shouldn't do research, but I'm simply saying, do we need more evidence to say that we have a problem? And look, these are the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere when each report came out. It keeps going up and up and up. So we have this incomprehensible scale of the crisis because of small numbers like 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, 3.7 degrees. It will be 3 degrees different between the morning when we wake up and the afternoon, correct? But how about large numbers? 39 billion tons of carbon emissions in 2022. Well, what does that mean? But these are the things that we use to try to invoke fear and to invoke you know, these kind of emotional responses. But it doesn't lead anywhere 
where we have then a rational conversation, like I hope happens here in a few minutes. 1.8 trillion tons of carbon dioxide. You know, 422 parts per million uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But look at this. This was the report about the, the um, Montreal Protocol, about the ozone hole problem we had when we were when we were creating a lot of you know these greenhouse gases called CFCs that, that that destroy ozone. Look, it's a warning color. It's yellow. It's got these logos on it. Here's the first IPCC report. It's a vacation photo, <laughs> right? <laughs> warning. Come to my beach and let's have a martini or whatever, <laughs> right? Look, this is, then, and look, we still haven't learned. This is the last one. This is, this is, you know, kind of the, what I call my hometown in Ashland, Oregon after a catastrophic wildfire a couple of years ago. So the northern part of the town burned down. And the following year, in 2021, one of the first places I worked as a biologist, the entire town was incinerated by a wildfire. It's happening now. Water temperatures are rising. You know, Oscar Sand Nuclear Power Plant has to shut down because jellyfish clog the pipe that brings the cooling water into the plant. Rivers and coastal waters are becoming too warm to cool our nuclear power plants. So if you start asking me, what do you think about using nuclear power? In a warming world, it also means we have warming water. Nuclear power plants need cold water. French nuclear power plants had to close down several times in 2022 because the water was too warm. You know, you'd think, you know, a country like the United States, with the, with the military bases that we have, you know, something like one trillion US dollars worth of um, assets in terms of military bases around the world. And you see the US's response to climate change. We're opening up new oil fields in, in, in Alaska. The IPCC report that, we, that I'm just discussing now makes it clear that we're likely to see half a meter, possibly two meters of sea level rise just by the end of the century. What does that mean for Sweden? We know that the Greenland ice sheet will release at least 27 centimeters of fresh water by the end of the century. Our cities are being affected by the thawing permafrost. So here we are at the end. Jim Henson, a famous NASA climate scientist, published this paper in a highly respected scientific journal just a few years ago. And he made this comment, burning all fossil fuels, we conclude, would make most of the planet uninhabitable by humans. No, no he didn't say about polar bears. He didn't talk about trees. He didn't talk about lions or pandas. He talked about humans, calling into question the strategies that emphasize adaptation to climate change. So in other words, much of the world talks like, we just need to adapt. We need to build carbon capture machines, so we just keep living the way we live today. Is it really a strategy to adapt to climate change by simply shifting all to green energy and buying bamboo toothbrushes? Is that really going to solve our problems? <coughs> and this is the good news. Pollution is optional. So when you talk about individually, this is the thing that we need to dissect the conversation into. Individually, what we do makes no difference in terms of the global problem. <coughs> Morally, of course, all of us in this room probably feel like we should do things, whether it's Erpo riding his bike, you know, whether it's the, the people in here who are vegetarians or vegans, whatever you do, if you choose not to fly, those things are important. But why they're important is because of our health and our communities. It doesn't have a massive impact on the planet. That doesn't mean it's not worth doing. But the IPCC report, the synthesis report, came clear. And what's interesting is they talk about 40 different areas, and I just took, captured a few of them, where we had the potential by 2030 to reduce our carbon emissions significantly. And what you can see here in the energy area, two areas, solar and wind, could reduce our carbon emissions by 9 gigatons per year by 2030, where all the other seven don't even add up to nine. And that is bioenergy, hydropower, geothermal, nuclear, carbon capture and sequestration, etc. So the point is, we have the technology. 
It's cheaper than any tech economist would have ever predicted 20 years ago in terms of the rate of change. Let's just do it because we're all living in this greenhouse together. So, I mean, I, you know, it's really hard for me because I'm trying to figure out if I'm going to come to a group and talk to a group of people now, what the hell am I supposed to say to people now? You know, 10 years ago, there was a debate whether how serious or not it was within many people in the public. But now I kind of feel like we got to move beyond that debate and start talking about what are we really going to do. And what we need to do is we need to change this government. And we need to start holding our politicians accountable. You know, even if we elect somebody from the Green Party, if, if, if the things aren't happening that we say need to happen for the future we want to live in, we need to fire them and bring in somebody else. You have to stop. Yes. Of course. I'm, I'm a politician. But they don't follow me. I use, I only use the old clothes. I make my own food. <laughs> <laughs> my boys, I have four boys. They tell me, if everybody are going to live like you, like me, all the shops are going to shut down. They are not going to earn money. And I tell them they can go outside and make they all, their own, grow their own potatoes, dry apple trees. So yeah. how, how can we, the, that's the big question. Well, how we, shall we change everybody? Well, I mean, th that's going to lead to the, the discussion here, but I think that the first thing I would say with that is that we have been brainwashed into believing that the economic system only survives if it's growing forever. When we live on a planet that's not growing, that's, that's a false narrative. And we've all bought into it in some way. And the second thing is everything is a zero-sum game. You're either making a profit or you're not. You know? I mean, the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecrafts that Carl Sagan sent out to the outer solar system to visit the, the outer planets to take pictures of our, that are outside the solar system today are running on a power plant Saturnus, it takes uh, seven years to go there. Yeah. They are on their way now. Yeah. To yeah. Saturnus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, think about it. If there's a spacecraft outside our solar system that was launched with 1960s technology, how is it that I have to replace the battery in here at a cost of like 60% of the re replacing the phone completely? And I can't even do it myself, right? I mean, it's all these little things that have constructed. And you know, the one thing that I've come to realize, right, especially because I spend so much time focusing on children, because I, you know, often children will say, well, what about the climate deniers? Or older people, some people will say, what about the climate deniers? I've come to the conclusion that, you know what? They're going to be dead in the future. So I need to focus on the generation of people that are going to make the difference and help them realize that they have a chance to decide what the future looks like. And when I talk to them, you know, it doesn't mean that we have to move back in a cave and that we won't have these different kinds of technology because that's the false narrative that's created. But that's because we live in a world where the shareholder is more important than the employee or the consumer or the communities where the companies are based. I mean, you're probably as old as I am, I'm guessing. And do you remember when, when we would watch the news in the 70s and 80s? If a big company fired 4,000 people, their stock would go down. Now the stock goes up. You know, during the COVID crisis, we were told we can't destroy the economy to protect, you know, the elderly generation in our communities, right? But that's based on the narrative that humans are not the economy. We are the economy. We need to take back that notion that we are part of it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.